Today we're going to be talking about the topic of osteoporosis. I know it's not a very exciting topic to, uh, to talk about. I mean, we're talking about old bones or crumbling old bones and people who are, who are suffering from pain. And uh, especially if you're a younger person, you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with me? Why are we talking about a subject like osteoporosis? Isn't that a rather obscure disease. You know, I've heard of an old lady once who had it. My grandmother might have had it or some old aunt may have had it. But osteoporosis, seriously, you're going to take a whole whole one hour TV program and you're going to talk about something like that. Well, the reason being is that it's not so obscure as you may have originally thought. The question of who gets osteoporosis uh, gets asked sometimes, and the answer is men get it and women get it and young people get it as well. And uh, the statistics are, uh, there was a journal, Osteoporosis International, that uh, came out in 1993. It says about 50,000 people in the U.S. die each year of problems related in some way to osteoporosis. So that, you know, given the, the population that we have there, it's, uh, it's a considerable problem. And it's certainly worth uh, working uh, throughout your life to avoid. For you women, one out of two women in North America, this takes in the entire North American continent, one out of two will develop osteoporosis. In fact, the statistics are telling us that sometime during your lifetime, you will experience at least one osteoporosis-related fracture. That's a pretty high rate of uh, incidence. That's very prevalent. And for those of uh, you who are men who are thinking, well, you know, that's a, that's a lady's disease, uh, with men, one out of five. Those are the current statistics. And I think it's well worth all of us spending some time to consider whether we are at risk or whether we are not at risk. You know, you look at the, the incidence of one out of two women, 50 percent, that's, that's an incredibly high uh, incidence. Teenagers are getting osteoporosis. Um, I was a little amazed to discover that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but teenagers tend to not consume enough minerals particularly calcium. 85% of teenage girls are simply not con uh, consuming enough calcium. Um, you know, the sources for calcium uh, are varied and they're, they're certainly abundant in the dietary uh, world, but the problem is that teenagers tend to, to eat what they like versus what their parents would uh, like them to eat. Uh, kids tend to, if it's potatoes, you know, their, their serving of potatoes is more than likely going to be French fries or potato chips. They're rarely going to actually eat a potato. Um, you want them to drink something, it's probably going to be a soft drink. If you go to any fast food restaurant or any restaurant and you watch teenagers, rare is it going to be to find a teenager that's going to drink anything other than a soft drink. That's their, their drink of choice. Some of them are going to be drinking iced tea. Again, that's going to be something that will actually deplete the, uh, the calcium uh, out of the bones. And uh, I'm going to talk about calcium for, for just a few moments. How you get your calcium uh, is very important. Um, we have on the marketplace, if you're listening to programs on the, on the radio, or listening to the advertisements, a lot of people are promoting uh, calcium citrate. And calcium citrate is basically a, a you know, limestone or a chalky type calcium that's had some citric acid uh, processed in with it in an attempt hoping, hoping that it has actually broken some of it down to make it a little bit freer for absorption. But really not all that absorbable. Most of the uh, supplements that you can purchase uh, from the drugstore or an, even a nutrition store, the majority of those are probably not going to be absorbable at a rate that exceeds 14 to 15 percent, and the rest is just going to go downstream. The uh, other form that we see very frequently would be calcium carbonate, a lot of people are taking calcium carbonate and calcium citrate as uh, absorbable minerals, but again, not terribly absorbable. 
Oh, back in the old days, we used to have a lot of people who were consuming bone meal. <clears throat> I remember as a child, my mother used to give me bone meal tablets all the time to make certain that I had strong bones. Actually was a pretty good source of calcium and was quite absorbable. The only problem is, is uh, those bones came from some creature who probably wasn't as healthy as I am. And in eating his bones and the material that made him up, um, a lot of us in, in the nutrition world today are getting a little bit squeamish about that. Some people are promoting uh, oyster shell calcium. I see that now and then. I remember as a child, my, uh, my father had some chickens and uh, he decided to get rid of his chickens because he said, you know, I think they're costing me money. It would probably be cheaper to buy the eggs from the market than to have and put up with these, these nasty chickens. And I said, oh, I'll miss the chickens because they're my friends. And tell you what, Dad, you let me have the chickens and I'll just take the best care of those chickens that I possibly can for a whole month. And at the end of the month, we'll look at all of my receipts, what I've spent and what I've made in money selling the eggs to other people. And we'll see if I've made any money or not. Well, at the end of the whole month of me working very, very hard with those chickens and washing the eggs and pedaling my bicycle, selling eggs to the neighbors and all that, I had made about a dollar and 50 cents. And uh, my dad said, you want to work that hard for a dollar and 50 cents? Man, I've got all kinds of other jobs for you. So we sold our chickens. But the point was, <clears throat> if we wanted nice hard shells, we would always feed oyster shell to our chickens. And they would eat that, and then it would, they would absorb it and turn it in. The problem that I have with consuming oyster shells is... Um, one day I'm looking in the aquarium and I'm just thinking about the whole biological activity of an aquarium and I'm thinking about the fish and the, you know, the bottom feeders and all the things. And my thoughts started going into the oceans and I began to think about the fact that uh, where, where do oysters grow? They grow in a part of the, uh, the seabed that we call the estuaries. And in the estuaries, that is the, that's the shallow part that's right up against a land mass, and it's, it's usually where some, uh, maybe some fresh water flows into that area, and it's a mixture of briny salt water and fresh water, and uh, all this silty water flows through there, and that's typically where they're going to be harvesting these little marine animals from. And I began to think about the, what their function is and how they survive, and they survive and gain their nutrition by pumping in this dirty water into their, into their selves and then pumping it back out and then they, they screen out whatever impurities are and they gain the nutrients from that. And I begin to think they're an aquarium filter. <clears throat> they're a, uh, a part of this microcosm in the ocean, but they really serve to the purpose to filter out impurities. And when I think of all the pesticides, agricultural wastes, sewage, heavy metals, things of that nature that are in these waters that are flowing out into these estuaries, I'm thinking that is probably one of the last things I want to take into my body. Another possibility that's been sold very, very uh, widely lately has been the coral calcium. Again, you're talking about a marine animal that sits there and gains its nutrients from what? From absorbing in water, taking the nutrition that it can get out of the water, sending it back out again. And of course, the coral calcium is simply the skeleton of a marine animal that's passed on and been harvested. So I'm not all that excited about that at all. If I were to consume a calcium supplement, I would more than likely be taking a chelated calcium. And by chelating, we're talking about the, the word chelate comes from the word a Greek word, uh, Latin uh, derivation of crab. It means it's got a lot of branches out and it grabs on. And what we do when we, in industry, when we uh, chelate a mineral, we bond it to amino acids. Now, amino acids are recognized widely by the human body as a building block of uh, body mass. It's, uh, it's where we come up with our, our protein molecules from by combining these, these uh, amino acids. And so the body recognizes these as food. And so the body will readily do an uptake of the amino acid. And if it's combined with a uh, 
an amount, uh, acceptable amount of some mineral, it would also absorb a higher degree of that mineral. So that's the reason that I, I particularly personally favor the chelated forms of minerals. And the important thing is for minerals, it's not just the calcium. You need to also have a, a, a ratio of magnesium along with your calcium. You need to have, you know, some, some probably some zinc and some boron and, and uh, micronutrients in there as well so that you've got a balanced uh, uh, spectrum of minerals. So where do we get the best balanced broad spectrum of minerals? From our food. And I think that... Uh, well, some of us, when we're in an in, uh, instance where we're suffering from uh, a lack of a particular nutrient, we can probably supplement that very, very successfully. But by and large, the best place to approach uh, dealing with your minerals is from the food that you eat. And we're going to talk about that um, a little farther in, down the road in our presentation today. I'm a visual person. Um, I have a real hard time with abstract things. I probably would never do well working in an IT job where, you know, I've got a headset on and I'm sitting there and somebody calls me and asks me to help them fix their computer over the telephone. Because uh, I've got to be right there at the keyboard to do what I'm going to do. Yeah, for you to tell me what your problem is really, really hard frustrates my wife really bad because she'll say she here something wrong with my computer here can you fix it and she wants me to fix it while I'm hanging over her shoulder uh, and she's got the fingers on the keyboard or she wants me to do it from the other room or she wants me to do it over the telephone or maybe it's through Facebook chat I'm supposed to fix a computer I can't see and I don't do so well with that uh, some people are awesome with that and I'm grateful we have people like that for tech support because sometimes I have to call them to get out of some issues that I deal with in some of my technology things but uh, so I had to come up with something that would help me see this whole thing <clears throat> visually uh, and so I, de I decided as I began to study into this topic of osteoporosis that it was a bigger issue than I thought it was. <clears throat> First, we thought it was, well, people just are not getting enough calcium. That was what uh, so many medical experts and nutrition experts were talking about for many, many years. Um, osteoporosis actually is not a disease that goes back into history all that far, uh, terribly prolific. Uh, it's more of a modern disease, and we'll understand why uh, further on. But I began to study it, and I had people say, well, you don't find it in this kind of a population or that kind of a population. And I... Uh, kind of wondered about that. And so I thought, well, okay, we'll get more minerals into these people. <clears throat> you know, uh, one physician told me I've never seen it in a vegan vegetarian. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. So I looked at that and I thought, no, that's not right. I'm finding it in lots of vegan vegetarians. Um, not as prevalent in, as in non-vegetarians, but I still found it significant enough number that I knew that that wasn't the answer. The, at least it wasn't the complete answer. It could be part of the answer, but not the total answer. And so I began to ask more and more questions. And, uh, you know, as I'm, as I'm trying to determine some way to find a solution to an issue. I always ask God to give me some wisdom. I just discover I'm not very wise. But with God's wisdom in my mind, there's, there's really not a whole lot that God can't do. And so I begin to ask God, give me some clues. And uh, he helped me understand that there were four main issues with osteoporosis. It wasn't just one. There were actually four so the example that we're looking at is a stool, a tall wooden stool with four legs. Well, what happens if you shorten one leg on your stool? Does it stand up? Well, it depends how much you shorten it. Maybe it tips and rocks a little bit, but if you shorten that leg enough, your, your stool is likely to tip over. You need all four legs to be at the proper length or proper height for your stool to be stable enough for you to sit on. So leg number one, we want to talk about things in our life, in our diet, that we want to avoid, uh, or at least limit. 
number one, <clears throat> number one would be soda pop. I know you don't call, uh, call that in every language where this or every continent where this may be shown, but uh, refreshments, soft drinks, the things that are carbonated beverages with sugar and all that kind of stuff. Because the issue is we have a high degree of these drinks being very full of sugar which can interfere with, the, with the, the mineral absorption. The next thing is almost all of these are very high in things like phosphoric acid, which phosphoric acid you can use to spray on a brick building and get all the old slag off of that building. It'll dissolve the, the calcifications uh, from rainstorms or water that's flowing over something. You can clean up concrete with acids. It actually will dissolve the minerals. And so when you're consuming a lot of phosphoric acid, you're definitely going to be thinning down your, your bone density. And that's one of the reasons, one of the contributing reasons that we find so many young teenagers uh, with the symptoms and signs of early onset of, of, uh, of osteoporosis. These guys go out and they're playing football and they get hit really hard and they take them in and they're like, wow, this kid's got a major fracture going on here. And uh, it almost looks like a bone density issue. How can that be? I mean, it's not a grandma. Yeah, he's, you know, he's really bulk and bulked up and, and strong. He's buff. And, and how can this be? Simply because of the intake of things like phosphoric acid from, the, from all of the refreshments that he's been drinking, as well as if you're going to be consuming a lot of dairy products, the problem that we have is we see a lot of billboards and we've got these popular figures, uh, sports uh, people and actors and actresses, and they've always got this cute little mustache and, and they, they want, to, want to inspire you to think that the more dairy you will consume, the stronger your bone structure will be. Two fallacies that I see, in my opinion here, number one is, you begin to consume a lot of dairy, you're also, you're getting a lot of calcium. Uh, granted, there's a lot of calcium in milk. The problem is you're getting a fairly high dose of phosphorus with that calcium. Um, if you look at mother's milk, it's a lower level of phosphorus for calcium simply because cows are supposed to mature from calves into adults in two to three years. Humans will go from, ba from infancy to adulthood, not in two or three years, but you know, perhaps 18 or 20 years. Our bone structure has to break down cell by cell and then rematerialize so that it can continue to grow symmetrically. And to do that, you have to have this we call osteoclastic, osteoblastic operation to where things break down and rebuild so that they continue to grow symmetrically bigger and bigger and bigger. And with the cow, it has to do it very rapidly. So there's high levels of phosphorus in order to trigger this activity. Where in a human, we have low levels of phosphorus because we want to do it slowly. But if we're consuming the calves formula versus the humans formula, you're, you're going to find that you actually could be detracting from your bone density if you're eating, you know, terribly significant levels of this stuff. So that's why I'm saying things that you may want to limit, not necessarily make this your, your main part of your diet. <clears throat> the other is thing that we notice that uh, people who are ingesting a lot of meat are ingesting a lot of protein. And uh, from the journal Science, dated back 1986, um, it says osteoporosis is caused by a number of things, one of the most important being too much dietary protein. When you're consuming a high level of dietary protein on a long-term basis, what happens is you begin to have uh, the, the whole entire system become more acidic instead of alkaline as the human body would normally function. If you're eating your fruits and your vegetables and your nuts and your grains and, and, and legumes and seeds and things of that nature, eating them in the proper balance, and you don't have an excessive amount of protein in the bloodstream, you don't have that acidic problem. Well, if you've got a high level of acid in your bloodstream, uh, you need to balance that out with something that in chemistry we'd call a base. 
in this in the body's situation, they will the body will then use calcium to balance it out. Where is it going to get calcium? It's going to get calcium first off from the bloodstream and from the muscles, <clears throat> but there's not very much of a reserve there, and so the secondary. Uh, source is where it's going to f uh, focus on the most, and that's going to be from your, your skeleton, from your bones, from your structure. And if you continue to take more than you put back in, you're going to see that little by little, you're going to thin your, your whole skeletal system down. You know, one of the things that I'm concerned of today is I see so many people searching for a better health Many people look at themselves in the mirror and they say, you know, there's just too much of me. Um, I've got to do something about this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I realized in looking in the mirror that there was too much of me. And uh, I noticed when I tried to put on clothes that I liked, there was too much of me to go into those clothes. And so my wife said, you know, you've been teasing me about, about my couple extra pounds for a long, long time. I think there's some, uh, some justice has happened here. And now you're going to be having to uh, eat your words. And, uh, you know, you're just going to have to go buy some new clothes. And I said, I don't have a wardrobe problem. I have a fat problem. And uh, something's going to happen. And so I began to change. And so a lot of us want to change. And many people have been watching newspapers, television programs, magazine articles, and they have begun to eat a high-protein diet in order to slim themselves back down. Does it work? On the short term, it does work. The problem is if you stick with it in a long term, you're continuing to uh, have this acidic nature in your blood, and you're continuing to have to steal calcium from your bone structure to balance out the, uh, <clears throat> the, the pH ratio in your bloodstream, and little by little, over the long haul, you begin to thin your, your bone structure down, take the density away. <clears throat> From the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition back in 1995, it says dietary protein increases production of acid in the blood, which can be neutralized by calcium from the skeleton, mobilized from the skeleton. So it's not just me saying this. This is what your, your scientists have been saying. It's clear back as early as 1995. Again, from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, this is back from 1979, something that we, uh, it's like, why, why haven't we seen this on, on big news programs? You know, this is big news to me. Even when eating 1,400 milligrams of calcium daily, one can lose up to 4% of his or her bone mass each year while consuming a high protein diet. So these high protein fad diets are not safe. Simply, if you're over the long haul, if you're going to do this. You know, I've seen people who, you know, uh, they look pretty good after they've lost, you know, 40 or 60 pounds. But if that is the way they have to maintain that weight loss and that condition, they need to rethink their whole dietary intake. From the, again, from uh, the Journal of Nutrition, 1981, increasing one's protein intake by 100% may cause calcium loss to double. Well, how much protein is good for you? You know, I see these guys, they're weightlifters, they're, you know, they're really ripped. They've got the, the six pack here, and uh, they've got the big muscles, and they're, they're doing all the weightlifting. They look pretty awesome. You think these guys are the total picture of health. You know, how much protein does it take to get where they're going? I was shocked when I was reading in my college nutrition textbook and the authors there from the studies that had been done were stating that a sedentary grandmother consume, should consume, you know, and they, they listed maybe perhaps 35 grams of protein a day, and they said a, a weightlifter or an Olympic athlete or an athlete in training can only utilize up to 10% more. And I thought, how can that be? Because, you know, these guys are lifting the weights and they're doing, I mean, this is all they do all day long. And surely, but they have to absorb it. The issue is that you can only utilize so much protein in your system based on the amount of hormones that your body is producing that allow that, that uh, utilization to take place. The rest, what happens to it? 
A, it causes acidic condition in the blood. The other, your urine has to, to carry it away. And it ends up being very, very damaging to the kidneys if you're going to do this over a very long period of time. <clears throat> Another thing we need to look at in, in, in terms of uh, the health of the bone structure is stress. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are as a honeycomb sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Now, sometimes we think, well, the Bible, were, or Bible authors didn't know a whole lot about anatomy and physiology. I mean, a case in point is they thought, the, they thought your thoughts were in your heart. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the more stress-free your life is, the more healthy your bone system is going to be. Your immune system is in your starts in your bone structure in the bone marrow, and if you don't if you don't have a healthy healthy sense of well being, your immune system begins to to go down. So I think uh, in Proverbs, King Solomon really understood more than what we really knew. Leg number two, we, the things to avoid. Uh, you know, we were talking about. Uh, you know, the high protein diet, eating a whole lot of dairy, staying away from the soda pop, um, stay away from caffeine, stay away from tobacco, stay away from alcohol. Those are a lot of things that, you know, somebody does want to avoid. I want to focus on the things that we should eat more of, things that we should consume more of. And those are going to be your grains. There is a significant amount of very highly absorbable calcium in all of the grains. Um, they may not be, tr you know, dramatically high where, you know, some, some people will say, well, you know, I want to get like 75 or 80 milligrams out of everything that I eat. And perhaps you're not going to find that in every one of your grains, but we're looking at the course of a day. How much, how much are we going to get? And so we want to look at our grains, our fruits, our vegetables, and our legumes. Point that we should look at, and that is what are our calcium needs? If you're a young person, 0 to 12, experts are telling us that perhaps, depending where your growth spurts are, 300, 500 milligrams of calcium per day. Um, if you're growing, you know, very quickly, in that zero to or that one to nine, that's where we tend to put on that that really fast initial growth, 500 to 700 milligrams. Uh, the 10 to 18, that's where suddenly you're, you're really beginning to, you know, broaden out. You see a young man, he goes from being this little stick and suddenly he, you know, he gets really wide and puts on some shoulders and, and um, thickens up a lot. You're very active, you're growing rapidly. And I remember when I was growing, I mean, I was this poor little kid who was always like about five foot tall in high school, and I hated it. You know, everybody of my peers, all the girls looked down at me for all kinds of reasons, I guess. I was just this little short kid, and I absolutely hated it. And I remember when I was able to uh, get an opportunity to go uh, to a boarding school, I went at about five foot one in my, my sophomore year. But I remember going back my junior year at six feet. And I had grown just tremendously. And of course, that would have been a time when I really needed that extra calcium because of my bone structure. And then when you get to 19 to 65, your, <clears throat> your uh, calcium needs, of course, you're not growing a whole lot. Uh, of course, some people are growing out, but <clears throat> generally we're not growing up uh, a whole lot after that. So the 1,000 milligrams a day is probably fairly realistic. Um, you know, if you get above 65, that seems to be where people tend to start losing some of their bone mass again. Experts are recommending to increase 1,200 to 1,500. That's what the experts are recommending. I'm going to suggest that perhaps by increasing one's physical activity, you may be able to continue on at that ratio that you were at and not necessarily need as much calcium. They're saying that pregnant and lactating women will need more. Postmenopausal women don't, they say, perhaps uh, <clears throat> may not need as much, which, uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure that I, I buy everything that the experts are saying today. One thing that I found very interesting is that in studying a tribe uh, in Africa, the Bantu people, 
And I was telling this at a, uh, at a seminar that I was giving in, in Eastern Canada. And uh, I, I mentioned the Bantu women in Africa. They're a, a tribe that uh, they live on a very, very meager subsistence. It's, it's the, the seeds and the, and the roots and, and berries and things that they can glean out of the forests and across the desert. Now and then they'll get some small animal or whatever, but primarily they eat some pretty meager dietary portions. And uh, their calcium intake is lower than any group of people in the world. There you would expect to see more osteoporosis simply because their intake is so low. But in studying, we find that these women uh, will have on an average of 10 babies in their lifetime. They will nurse all of them, and it has never been known to have a Bantu woman with osteoporosis. And uh, I was at this, this conference, and when I said that, this lady stood up and she said, that's right, because I'm Bantu and I know that. And uh, I, th I thought, well, that's, that's good. Something I read was actually, f actually for real. Calcium sources. <clears throat> Pinto beans, you know, we always think if you're going to get calcium, you need a big fat slice of some kind of a dairy product, or, you know, you need a, a, <clears throat> a tablet of some sort. Calcium sources, I'm just going to give you a variety here. Your pinto beans, uh, you've got 75 milligrams out of one cup. Tofu, which is uh, something that originally most of us Western people knew nothing about, uh, and it was an Asian thing. Um, I grew to really love it when I lived for a while, a short time in Japan, and I used to I'd hear this man riding down the, down the street on this big three-wheeled tricycle contraption thing and he had this little platform on the back and he had a little cover over it and he'd go down the street and he had this like an old-fashioned school bell and he'd be driving down the street ringing this bell and I finally found out from somebody what that was I kept saying what is that guy and I finally somebody found someone who understood my English well enough they said it's the tofu man <clears throat> so I chased him down and I'd buy these chunks of tofu from him now and then just so that I got a chance to enjoy it and I really learned to love it there Four ounces will give you 250 milligrams or more, depending on the type of, of tofu, whether it's you know, more firm or, or a little bit softer. <clears throat> I tend to really love Mexican food and tortillas. Uh, it's the foundation. I think uh, tortillas are just an excuse to, to eat, and all the rest of the stuff is just something you add to the tortilla. But I, uh, I see that tortillas will have up to 85 or more milligrams, kind of depending on whether they're big ones or small ones. If they're a, a flour tortilla or a corn tortilla, the ones here that we're quoting are corn tortillas. Spinach, again, nice and high. Uh, one cup of spinach uh, give you about 240 milligrams of, of calcium per day. Kale, which is my favorite green. I don't care for some of the greens a whole lot, but kale I love. And I love it in just about any way you can make it. I like it when people like marinate it and put it in the food dryer and you make like chips out of it and put it in a bag and you can take it with you if you're on the trail. Um, or even if you steam it or boil it, it's, it just may, it doesn't get slimy and, and mushy like some of the other greens. So I love it because it, can, it has a consistency and a texture. But one cup, about 179 milligrams. Collards, which uh, the people in the deep south in the United States like, I don't particularly care for those a whole lot. I guess I didn't grow up on those. But they're still very high at 178 milligrams. <clears throat> and even your one cup of just plain, you know, normally wheat, and doesn't. It, this is not even registered as whole wheat spaghetti, just regular Durham spaghetti, 33 milligrams. So you begin to look at sources, and if you have a variety of foods, you're going to get enough, enough calcium. In fact, it's been said by many nutritionists that if you're eating, even at a, from a vegeta total vegetarian diet, if you are eating a variety of foods, a balanced variety, it's impossible to not get enough calcium. So the worry about Intake, I think, uh, should look more at the type of source uh, <clears throat> versus the ability to, to eat enough. Um, leg number three is exercise. 
Your bone density is determined very much by how much exercise you get. You know, if you take uh, the bone out of your arm and you were to be able to twist it like this, we think of our bones as being very brittle, but they actually are <clears throat> rather springy. And they actually have a, a, a spring uh, torsion built into them. And when you actually will bend your bones ever so slightly because you've placed some heavy weight on them, there are receptors there that send messages to your brain via the neurological system that tells the brain, I'm being put under a whole lot of work down here. And uh, it's a little more than I'm comfortable with. I'm kind of afraid that perhaps this load that you've placed upon me may be more than I'm capable of carrying. And uh, if this happens too many more times, I might be in trouble. So can you send me a little, you know, a little help down here? And so the body then sends out the, the hormonal system, tells the hormonal system, you need to send out more hormones to allow this, this calcium molecules uh, to actually come in and become part of a new bone structure, and let's add some more bone cells. And so little by little, we begin to strengthen the bones, and they begin to get thicker and more dense. And so exercise is very important. That's why your physician, if you're going to get tested and they tell you that your bone density is not up to par, one of the first things they're going to tell you is you need to get involved in weight-bearing exercise so that you stress the bones and give uh, some ability to actually strengthen them one more time. The fourth leg uh, on our four-legged stool are our hormone systems. <clears throat> and as I had mentioned before, without the hormones, you can't store. And uh, for many years, medical uh, professionals were prescribing estrogen supplements to women so that they could maintain their bone structure. And then along about, oh, say five or six years ago, some studies were released that, oh, these estrogen supplements are now causing other things. <clears throat> they may have in, uh, helped to maintain some bone density in some women, but now we're having issues with other things. We're having cardiovascular disease issues that perhaps were related to this. And perhaps we're beginning to see a higher incidence in certain types of female cancers because we've added some estrogen. <clears throat> the problem being here was that the estrogens that were be given, being given to the patients were either of a synthetic nature or they were the type that were actually derived from animals. Uh, people don't realize it, but there actually are still large farms where horses, the mares, are kept pregnant. They are kept water deprived so that their urine will be very concentrated and their urine is collected and the estrogen from these pregnant mares is then now collected and taken off to a laboratory and the estrogens then are, are uh, collected from that, uh, that, that uh, source. And that's one of the issues that uh, women were having problems with is because this is foreign to their body and not really what they needed. So what we're looking at, I call the strong bones team of, of uh, hormones, the estrogen that most women need is called estradiol. There are other forms of estrogen, but they're involved more in pregnancy and, and other types of development. But the one that'll hold your bones together is called estradiol. Another one is called progesterone, and the last one is testosterone. And many women will say, testosterone? Are you kidding me? I don't want testosterone. You know, that's for my husband. I don't want to grow a beard. You know, I don't want five o'clock shadow. I'm a girl. But men and women all have these same hormones. We have all, all of us, you know, men, we have some estrogen, we have some progesterone, we have some testosterone. You know, the interesting thing about hormones is, is if a woman has her hormones out of balance, everybody knows it. <clears throat> everybody knows it. If a men's hormones are out of balance, nobody can figure out what's wrong with them because we haven't been in tune to men's hormonal issues long enough for anybody to get a handle on it. But if a, and, and perhaps a man will be more like he might be a little, a little less drive. He might be a little more discouraged. He's not out in the garage cleaning it anymore. He's sitting on the sofa clicking the, the remote instead. Uh, doesn't quite have as much enthusiasm for life. 
<clears throat> maybe doesn't sleep quite so well. Whereas a woman, if her hormones are low, she's not sleeping uh, the way she ought to be. Her, her emotions are all over the charts. And, uh, you know, everybody in the family is, is suffering from it. So the, the answer that I am suggesting, I am a proponent of bioidentical or plant-based hormones. Um, there are many, many practitioners across uh, the world today who are beginning to do an excellent job of helping you test your hormones and determine what your needs are. Um, some of our practitioners are a little bit behind times and they only read a, they only read a value and they say, oh, you're in range, you're good. Others do a little more work and they actually do some work with their math and they do the ratios in between and they find out how to get you in balance a little bit better. I recommend finding someone that can help you get your hormone levels tested, whether it's a, a doctor or a nurse practitioner or somebody that'll, that specializes in that and can help you determine what your actual needs are. Don't take some, some cream or some pill just because your sister did or the lady across the street did because her needs are not the same as your needs. You'll actually create a detrimental situation in your body if you do that, more than likely. But if you can be tested and you determine what your needs are, it will help you um, build that fourth leg on this, on this four-legged stool so that it can stand up. You know, I've seen people lost with osteoporosis through the course of their life. I had a, a great aunt who developed osteoporosis a number of years ago. And... Uh, you know, I really would have liked to have gotten involved in her care, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't one of those things that could happen. And I saw her going from this, this, this normal height, robust little old lady who just seemed to be invincible. You know, I remember when I, I went to see her one time, she was, I think, about 85 years old. And she said, I said, what are you doing? Have you retired yet? She said, no, I'm still taking care of old people. And I found out the old people were younger than she was. And so activity had helped her somewhat, but as she began to slow down, her diet was not good and her hormone system wasn't good. And I watched her literally just crumble away. And, you know, she died with this very porous skeleton and she was like four inches shorter than she'd been when she was younger and, it, and she'd had so many compression fractures. It was just heartbreaking to watch what happened to her. <clears throat> That's a sad story, but a, a happy story is um, when my mother was in her 60s, um, my sister took her and got her some diagnostic work up, and uh, the radiologist told my mother that he was very concerned because she had osteoporosis. Uh, it was, you know, it wasn't severe yet, it was beginning, you know, she better be taking care of it or whatever. And... Uh, we were, we were concerned about it, and so we began to uh, help my mother understand that she needed to exercise. And she began to go out and walk faithfully every day, rain or shine. She was out there walking, getting her weight-bearing exercise, her diet. She was always, always looking for better ways to eat. Um, and uh, she, she changed her diet. She began to take out all the excessive proteins and she began to replace a lot of the stuff with, with plant-based foods to where she was uh, living a pretty pure Edenic sort of a dietary program. And uh, you know, my sister helped her a lot with her, with her hormone issues. And of course she wasn't drinking or smoking or you know, doing all those things that we always recommend to people not to do and she wouldn't touch soda pop. And, and uh, I don't know, I just kind of forgot about the whole issue. I, it, it actually slipped my mind that she'd ever had an issue with, with a bone density. And uh, one day I got a call from my sister. She said, hey, you need to really pray. Mom's been in a car accident. And at that point, mom was about 80, 83 or 84 years of age. And she, as her habit was, was headed off to the community services to put in her 30 whatever hours a week uh, in volunteer work for the community. And she'd be helping with food banks or sorting clothing or things of that nature. And she was on her way to work and a lady who was a diabetic had given herself her insulin shot that morning, forgotten to eat her breakfast, 
and she passed out at the wheel on this really high bridge, and that happens to be where she hit my mother head on. And my mother was driving a little Ford Tempo, and the uh, ambulances got there, they couldn't get her out of the car, they called in extrication, they cut her car literally into little pieces to get her out of it, she was trapped in it so badly. They took her to the hospital and there they x-rayed her from head to toe to determine how many fractures this little old frail looking grandmother was going to have. And about that time they called my sister and they said, Julie, get over here from her clinic to over to the hospital. Your mother is in the ER and she's asking for you. So she, you know, just got up and ran across the parking lot. She goes over there and there's my mom. She was expecting to see her in really bad shape. And she had a couple of bumps and bruises and contusions, but nothing too bad. And, uh, the radiologist is putting films up on the light box and uh, he's sitting back and he's looking at him and he's looking at him and he's looking at him and he looks at her and he said, wow, this lady's got the skeleton of a 40 year old. And my mother, of course, she quips up and she said, well, it's because I'm a vegan vegetarian. And he got very angry and stormed out of the room, especially when my sister said, well, you are the one who di diagnosed her with osteoporosis about 24 years ago. Um, she did everything right. And I think that's really the issue here. And the fact was, she didn't just get exercise. She didn't just change her diet. She didn't just do her, take her hormones. She didn't just avoid some things. She did everything. And that balanced total approach is what it took to put her back together again. You know, the amazing thing is that she's going to be turning 95 in a, a few weeks. Um, and even though she is a little on the frail side, she still has yet to ever have a fracture. Her bone density still is the bone density of someone dramatically less than, than her age. You know, I'm thinking about uh, in every situation where I look at the physical body, I also like to look for a spiritual practical application. And when I read in the Bible from, from Psalms 31, chapter, chapter 31 and verse 10, it really almost describes a severe osteoporosis patient. It said, for my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing, my strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. <clears throat> and I thought about that, and I said, you know, that really almost sounds like somebody who had in a, a severe end stage of of this, this disease, of this progression, because they, their life is very unpleasant. There's a lot of pain and discomfort associated with it. Their strength is failing. I mean, how can you exercise your muscles when there's nothing to you know, hold them together to move <clears throat> and your bones are consumed? And I, and I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea here. I'm not suggesting that you have osteoporosis because of your iniquity. Not saying that it's a sin to have osteoporosis. I'm just trying to make a dual application here to this particular piece of scripture. <clears throat> and I thought about it in a spiritual sense. My life is spent with grief and my years with sigh and my strength fails because of my iniquity. Iniquity basically means you have a sinful human nature and it has played out its game in your life and your life is now being unhappy. You know, I, you can look at somebody who's had a, a sad Christian experience and they've, they've walked away from the Lord and they've done everything they were big and bad enough to do. And as they're coming to the end of their life, they look back and they see this sordid trail behind them and they're miserable. They're spiritually and emotionally wrecks because they look back and they've got all of this guilt and they've got all these burdens and they're basically their life is consumed with it. And it's not a pretty picture. It's a sad picture. And one of my, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my passions in life is evangelism. And I love to share the gospel of the salvation that Jesus Christ brings to a life with people who haven't heard it before. And if you have heard it before, I love to remind you about it again anyway, because maybe you haven't done everything you need to do with it. But one of my favorite passages that I like to get people's attention with and to help them understand their predicament in life comes from Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. And it tells us here, that your iniquities have separated you from God. Between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, and he will not hear. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, 
What happened? Could God come down there evening by evening and spend his time with them? No, he had to separate himself because his physical presence, because of how holy and pure and powerful he was, and how now they had become with, stricken with a fallen nature, they were sinful. If God would have brought his physical presence with, if when the close proximity of their physical presence, he would have destroyed them. And so in his love and his mercy, he backed away from them so that he would not destroy them. And he began to work this long distance love program by sending his son Jesus and sending his prophets and sending the Holy Spirit down here that he may be able to reach out and touch our lives. Our iniquities are separating us between us and our God and he's not very happy about that. God wants to be able to get back in our presence. You know, you can imagine you're a parent and suddenly you've, you're... You, if you brought your presence into, the, into your child's presence, you'd kill them. I mean, it'd kill you. You'd, you'd want to reach out and put your arms around them, but you can't touch them. <clears throat> but there's good news for that. One of my favorite passages comes from Micah. Micah 7, and it's from verses 18 and 19. It says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again, and he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. God wants to restore that connection. God recognizes that we are incapable of restoring our connection with him. And so he is telling us that he will deal with the problem. That iniquity, that fallen human nature that each one of us was born with in this world after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, our, our legacy, our inheritance, it's who and what we are. God says that he will have compassion upon us and he will subdue it. You know, there are many people in the world today who are struggling to make themselves good enough to be acceptable with God. And you and I cannot do that. I can never make myself so good and so perfect and so holy through my own strength that I can present myself presentable to God. I've tried it. I went through many years thinking, you know, somehow I'm going to get myself cleaned up enough that God will accept me. And it got worse and worse and worse. And I finally realized through my study that God will accept me right where I am right now, this very moment today, although he does not intend to leave me where he finds me. That's a difference in some of the gospels being preached. Some people said God will take you right where you are and that's what, he, that's what he accepts and he loves you and you can go right straight to heaven. But God says, I found your iniquity and your iniquity <clears throat> and I'm going to subdue it. I found you in the gutter and you're all covered in filth in your own vomit. No, I'm not going to leave you like that. I'm going to clean you up and I'm going to restore you and I'm going to lift you up and give you a new nature if you'll only cooperate with me. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11 says, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? So the choice is ours. God says, I will lift you up. I will find you in your filth. I will find you and I will, I will give you my compassion. I will subdue your iniquity. You don't need to die. Another passage says, I don't have any, any desire that you will die. And here he says, I have no pleasure in your death. God's pleasure is in restoring each one of us. He wants to subdue it and change us and to give us a whole new nature. As God can restore us physically by living our lives the way he in intended, I mean, you look at the Garden of Eden. God put Adam and Eve there. Did he put any chemical factories there? <clears throat> Did he put any um, toxic waste dumps there? Did he put any alcohol there? Did he put any tobacco there? 
Did he put any drugs there? Did he put any sofas and TVs and remotes there? No, God put a garden there. He put Adam and Eve in the garden. He told them, dress it, keep it, plant it, harvest it, work, you know, physical labor. There's plenty of pure water running through the garden. Drink of the water, eat the fruits, you know, get your strength, use your strength, continue to build up your system and maintain your health, and I will sustain you. But the, the way that we live today is so different from what God had intended for us. We try to do as little as we possibly can. Everything needs to be about convenience and savings of time and savings of energy. And uh, that's how we want to live our lives. And now our lives are beginning to be more and more as focused on leisure time as if we can find it. We're all living in the fast lane, but that we're all desperate for some leisure time, some time, some discretionary time that we can spend on ourselves uh, as a distraction away from the misery that we live in. <clears throat> and so it's spent so often in doing idle things that have nothing to do with keeping our bodies strong. We need to exercise. We need to drink the pure water. We need to drink or eat the fruits and the vegetables and the grains and the legumes. That's the program that God said would restore us and pro- physically and protect us from physical disease. And God also recognizes on a spiritual nature that we sometimes have to stress our spiritual bones as well. God says, I need to see you exercising. I need to see you on your knees. I need to see you helping other people. I need to see you sharing your, your knowledge of me with other people. And by doing that, I will make you stronger. You see, the physical and the spiritual are so intertwined, we cannot live one without the other. <clears throat> and where God says that he will subdue our iniquities physically and spiritually, he, he will restore us both ways. Follow his presentation of, of the plan of, <clears throat> of health in, in the Bible, and you will enjoy good health. Follow his presentation of the plan of salvation in the Bible, and you will enjoy spiritual health as well. And God it is his choice and his desire for each one of us that we will come to a fuller knowledge of him, that we will share that knowledge with one another, that we'll lift one another up, that we'll encourage each other, and by encouraging one another, we become strengthened in our own right. That same way that we gain the bone density by that, that exercise, God says you'll gain your strength and your spiritual bones by, by, stra- by straining those things to help other people. I can tell you as I, as I travel around the world, every time I share the message of Jesus Christ with people in, a, in another country somewhere, I come away stronger than I left. Yes, it's a strain to get on airplanes and fly all over the world. Yes, it's a strain to eat strange foods or to go without foods because I can't find things. Yeah, it's a strain to be away from your family. Yeah, there's a lot of inconveniences. You fly across time zones and you don't know whether it's daytime or nighttime. A lot of things that are, that are ne- perhaps negatives there. But still, in spite of that, what I gained from all of that is helping other people builds me and strengthens me and gives me something that I've never ever could come up with on my own. <clears throat> God has a plan for you physically and God has a plan for you spiritually. And if you'll follow that plan, you do not have to suffer the consequences like those who do.